Many here in Canada are still in mourning after a Ukrainian passenger jet was shot down shortly after takeoff into Tehran, Iran, leaving 176 dead, including 57 Canadians. Iranian protesters are demanding leaders quit after the military admits it shot down the plane. Joining me now to talk about it is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari. Lisa, protests continue in Iran and here in Canada. We want answers. Was it really human error that brought down Flight 752? Human error, a mistake, did they miss intentionally on the missiles in Iraq? Uh, there's so many different explanations for all of this, but the bottom line is that they killed their own civilians. Uh, and of course, Canada, um, Ukraine, uh, the UK, whoever had passengers abo aboard, their you know, citizens aboard, uh, that flight should be demanding answers from the Iranian regime. It's crazy how we are in this place where uh, you know, fingers are being pointed at everyone except for the Iranian regime, who has been responsible for the for the deaths in this in this equation. Um, it wasn't Donald Trump who brought down that plane uh, at the. Uh, it was it was very upsetting for some people who wanted to believe that narrative, uh, but it was the regime themselves. And you know what? We should just take a cue from the Iranian people who are on the streets demanding answers from their government about this plane, about the citizens of of Iran who were killed on this plane senselessly and um, you know, de demanding better. I mean, they've been disenchanted with their government for a very, very long time. This government has been in place for four decades following the toppling of the Shah. And you know, you have a, a, a population of 80 million, majority of whom um, you know, are, are very much disenchanted. They want answers. They don't want their government putting them in the place of economic isolation under sanctions, uh, putting them in the place of getting into um, you know, wars with different countries. and, and more than anything, using their money, that main street economy money, and putting it into terrorism. Why should the people of Iran um, suffer or starve or go jobless while the government puts money into Hezbollah's pockets and into Gaza and into Syria and into Yemen and into Iraq and the list goes on? So, you know, the people of Iran are asking very important questions. I think uh, Canadians are asking very important questions and they're pressing Trudeau to uh, press the Iranian regime here. Um, this is not okay. You know, we talk about war. We talk about, will there be a war with Iran? Well, what will war look like in the year 2020? You know, the things that we're seeing right now, these are provocations that are, you know, aspects of, of war, um, if, you know, otherwise known by a different name. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely, you know, imperative for leaders around the world to unite, regardless of how they feel, regardless of how badly they wanted that Iran nuclear deal, to unite and ask the, the, the important questions. U.S. President Donald Trump has a warning for Iran. Do not kill your protesters. The United States is watching. Iranians are standing up and asserting their rights, with many yelling, death to the dictator. Yes, so we see that the situation, the protests are getting more and more bold because of the uh, slogans and the chants that we're hearing from the protesters. I've posted a lot of these videos from the from Iran that are sent to me um, with the chants that I translate, uh, and and more and more they're saying death to the dictator or the dictator has to abdicate or you know we don't believe you anymore. You're liars and you kill our own, and we're going to avenge the deaths of our own brothers that were killed. Uh, and as as these slogans get more and more courageous, we know that the Iranian people they they want they want better. They want a different tomorrow. They don't want to continue with this government. The issue with the Iranian uh, protesters has always been who will lead them in the next chapter if there should be a regime change, if they should be successful in toppling this current uh, regime. Uh, but, you know, I think more than anything, we have to understand how um, so many of these narratives that are flying around Western media are so incorrect about how, you know, Iranians were upset about the death of Soleimani, about how, you know, they're upset at America for starting, um, you know, this tit for tat kind of exchange between the Iranian regime and the U.S. Um, and, and, and so on. But more than anything, we're seeing how these protesters are, are upset. They're not going back home. I mean, more than 1,500. I mean, some estimates say 1,500, but from what I'm hearing, it's it's well into uh, two or 3,000 protesters were killed last month in, in uh, 
protests across Iran. Now, will that happen again? Will they start killing them again? The main goal of this regime has always been to stay in power, and they will do anything to remain in power. And uh, I, I'm afraid this is going to get bloodier and worse before it gets any better. Meanwhile, chants of death to England could be heard outside of the British embassy in Iran and calling for the ambassador to be expelled and the embassy to be shut down. The British ambassador was arrested, and the U.K. says it's a violation of international law. Tell me more about that. Yes, so here we have these, again, inconvenience, uh, inconvenience of truth, as we say, um, for the Europeans who have wanted so badly to stay uh, on good terms with the, with the Iranian regime. For 40 years, every time there has been you know, an issue, especially with the United States pulling out, not having a consulate there, not having diplomatic relations with the Iranian regime, the Europeans have remained. They have pushed for these, this economic relationship with Iran. And now you see the the uh, the Consul General there attended what he thought, he says, was a, a prayer vigil for the victims of the Ukrainian flight, but turned out to be a protest against the government. And right away when he left, he was arrested um, for attending an anti-government protest. Now, again, this highlights um, that the, the Europeans have no business uh, remaining uh, on the side of the Iranian regime when this is how they're treated, when their own are arrested and thrown into Iranian prisons, when the, they know and we have proof that the Iranians are cheating on the nuclear deal and had been cheating even when they were a signatory to that deal. So, you know, um, this is yet another story about how Europeans are getting caught in this kind of crossfire between the West and the Iranian regime and choosing to remain with the Iranian regime, but it's nothing new. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, Lisa, a couple of U.S. troops were tragically killed by another roadside bomb. Yes, this is in Kandahar. This is in the southern province. Um, another attack claimed by the Taliban that have really no shame in claiming these attacks against U.S. civilians and then U.S. citizens, rather, uh, and then uh, pretending like all is well uh, when they want to come back to the negotiating table between the Taliban and the United States to create stability in Afghanistan. That's the irony of the whole situation. This uh, terror organization will be entrusted with creating any sort of stability within Afghanistan, and this is the way that they have behaved over and over again. Hal, you and I, week after week, talk about these different attacks by the Taliban, usually against um, you know civilians in, in Afghanistan, but this time against uh, U.S. military personnel, uh, which, which makes it obviously hit closer to home. Uh, but will this put a, more of a strain on the ongoing talks? Will this put kind of a, a pause? We've had ceasefires before. We've had a, like a hiatus from this from the talks between the Taliban and the United States. But the reality doesn't change. Another day, another terror attack, and this is the group that we're dealing with. It's the Taliban. But uh, really, it's 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 very very uh, sad to see Afghanistan uh, not be able to achieve that stability for its people, for our troops out there, um, for everyone who's involved. Hezbollah has been threatening U.S. troops and has vowed retaliation against Israel. Uh, they say it's payback for the U.S. strike which killed Iran's top general, Soleimani. All right. So when we say Hezbollah, we should really just say it's a, it's a, a, a tentacle of the Iranian regime. Hezbollah is, is equivalent with the Iranian regime that propped up or created uh, that terror organization in the aftermath of the 1979 toppling of the Shah. They created Hezbollah to do their dirty work in the region and to create to to do their proxy work. Um, and you know, ever since then, they've created this this cancerous sore for for Lebanon that has attacked Israel, that has has been responsible for dozens and dozens of of horrific terror attacks that have have. Uh, uh, targeted Western and, and Israeli uh, targets. And now they have, again, uh, threatened the U.S., obviously, for the killing of Soleimani, who is a part of, of course, the, the uh, Revolutionary Guard, another tentacle of the Iranian regime. Uh, again, business as usual for these terror organizations. This man, Soleimani, was a valuable asset to the Iranian regime, to their proxy work, to their regional uh, endeavors. Uh, he was operating in Syria, but had a hand 
um, in Iraq and in um, throughout the Middle East in, in ordering the attacks. You want to look at uh, the different places in the Middle East where Iran had activities in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, and Soleimani was involved in all of that, including ordering the deaths of protesters to be killed back at home when they rose up last month. So, you know, this guy was, was a point man. He was a smart guy. He was called the shadowy commander because nobody could catch him. So now that he's been caught, it's a big blow to Iran. It's a big blow to their tentacles. It's a big blow to Hezbollah. Uh, so it's as easy as that. So when these threats come in, it's it's nothing new. And we saw some retaliation. Now, what will happen next? Um, who knows? A story which made headlines across Canada here and the world was how Canadian officials accidentally pushed the nuclear alert to millions of people. The nuclear station located at Pickering, Ontario, just east of Toronto, mm -hmm. triggered the mass emergency alert here in Canada that was sent accidentally. Lisa, it kind of sounds a little bit like a Homer Simpson moment. Yeah, exactly. This is like uh, when you say smartphones not being so smart or smart, smart technology not being so smart. Um, look, this is the side effect of having all this technology and all the ability to reach people so quickly is the, the ability to in, uh, incorrectly, accidentally reach people so quickly. You know, think about um, how many posts people put up accidentally or hit a button or text people accidentally. I mean, this is on a ma massive scale. Um, but now at least the people around Toronto know that this system works and God forbid there should be something they know that this will work but again the downside of this being this is like the boy who cried wolf should this happen again if it is accurate will people believe it or will, will they just you know kind of shrug and say it's probably another accident so there we have both sides of that but um, you know accidents happen that's true the US and China have resumed regular talks in an effort to resolve various conflicts between the countries tell me more about that yes yeah, so you know uh, Interestingly, after the Soleimani uh, craziness kind of, um, I don't want to say blew over, but it was kind of put on the back burner on, on um, Monday morning, we wake up to the news that, you know, uh, President Trump is gung-ho about taking the China deal further. We are told that the phase one um, aspect of the deal is done and that we're looking forward to um, phase two and, and to, to move forward with um, with more further or, or more details of, of the deal between the two countries. We know for a fact that the reason that the deal didn't work out the first time is because there are certain points that China will not compromise on and that the U.S. is a no-go on. So so um, these are the, the, the non-negotiables for President Trump, and they particularly involve um, intellectual property and copyright laws and, and things like that, things that the Chinese have been known to do to the U.S., to copy every, you know, everything that the U.S. does, whether it's in technology or in luxury goods or in drones um, or, you know, anything, anything else. So um, this will this, be interesting to see wh how far the U.S. and China can get this round uh, and we know that there has been economic damage on both sides. We know that both sides, uh, when you look at the exporters and importers, are eager for there, there to be a deal and for the tariffs to be reduced. So we'll see how far they get this time around. The White House has reached out to North Korea to resume talks, Lisa. U.S. President Donald Trump has even personally reached out to Kim Jong-un, saying he wants to chat again. Yes, it looks like President Trump is definitely interested in becoming the foreign policy uh, president. He's going down his checklist of unresolved items, loose ends that he must tie up before elections. Uh, and North Korea is obviously on that list. He was very much enthused, as was most honest people, that he was able to get that first sit down with Kim Jong Un, who was this isolated, you know, sleeping giant. And now, you know, he has to keep poking that giant in order to move this forward. Um, very interesting relationship between the two. There have been letters that have been exchanged. They became pen pals. They became greatest of friends. And then they also exchanged quite, um, you know, stringent uh, uh, comments between the two. Uh, so we'll see how this, this moves forward. But I think, again, North Korea um, is not as... Um, it, it's, it's a different threat than we have with the Iranian regime. The uh, North Koreans are, are quite isolated uh, versus the Iranian regime that's looking to export its agenda uh, throughout the world, throughout the Middle East at the very least. Um, so, you know, you have the North Koreans that are, are isolated. Donald Trump wants to break that isolation, wants to create a normalized uh, nation out of them. And we'll see if Kim Jong-un is, is interested in the offer. 
Now, here's an interesting story. A 44-year-old Japanese billionaire has a cool idea for a date. He wants to take a girl to the moon. I want to give you the moon. Whatever happened to dinner and a movie? That's what I want to ask you. Uh, yes, this billionaire has decided that he wants to take that trip up to the moon, and now he's looking for the most eligible girl to take along with him. He has three children. He just recently broke up with his 27-year-old girlfriend, and he's fresh on the market and has a fresh idea as to what a romantic first date will be. And the, what are the qualifications? She has to be single and over 20 years of age. So eligible ladies, start signing up and see if you can take that trip with him. Now, speaking of ladies, the only woman to ever win an Olympic medal for Iran just defected. Kimya Alizida won a bronze medal in Taekwondo at the 2016 Games in Rio de Janeiro. And Lisa, she says, enough's enough when it comes to oppression. She's done. She had the most beautiful Instagram post saying goodbye to her people, goodbye to her country, and goodbye to the men uh, in the regime who oppressed her for many years. Last night, I uh, sat and translated this very long, detailed tweet, uh, sorry, Instagram post uh, in which she says goodbye to her people and says, it was your support that got me to where I am, but I was always a political and economic pawn for the leaders of, leaders of our country, and I will no longer be that pawn. I'd rather be nothing because I was nothing to them. Uh, and I, you know, and they will always look down upon me because I was a woman. So she made an, an incredible, incredible and selfless decision to leave her country, to go to the Netherlands, uh, to start all over. And again, like you said, she's, she's a champion. She's, you know, instead of staying in the country in which she represented and being the superstar that she is, uh, she's forced to leave the country and to, you know, just to be free as a woman. Uh, you know, where are the, the women's rights, you know, movement leaders on this story and on stories like these? You know, when you hear about this, she, she can't live a normal life as a female athlete in this country of Iran. Um, and these are the stories that we should be telling. These are the stories that, that really paint a broader picture about the reality of women, the reality of minority groups uh, in the Middle East and uh, make us, uh, you know, very fortunate that we have this platform and that we should use it to tell these stories and to be a voice for them. And it'd be quite the story, too, if she were to compete for the Netherlands in an upcoming Olympics, wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thanks so much, Lisa. My pleasure.